California in being a really forward looking state uh, has uh, set goals to uh, make all trucks cleaner over time and to also decarbonize them. So uh, starting in 20, by 2030, uh, 30% of all the new trucks sold in California uh, will be zero emission. And, and by trucks, I really mean everything from a, say, a FedEx delivery van that's in the neighborhoods all the way up to a, a big rig. So 30% of all the new commercial vehicles sold uh, in 2030 will be zero emission. And by 2036, we'll get to 100% of, of all those uh, trucks and vans sold being zero emission. Uh, what this will mean is that, first of all, that California is really going to be contributing and, and showing that we can decarbonize the commercial vehicle sector. Secondarily, uh, well, the result will be much cleaner air. So uh, the communities that have lived near the ports, near distribution centers, near highways, that for decades have been impacted by diesel pollution, lives have been shortened, lives have been lost due to that air pollution. Those people living in those communities uh, will start to breathe clean, healthy air for the first time and be able to have better, longer lives, which will be really important. Then the third benefit is that and we're already seeing this, is that those rules will result in tremendous industry growth uh, here in California and elsewhere uh, that we will uh, be, we're seeing new zero emission truck companies, manufacturers come to the fore. We're also seeing a lot of uh, infrastructure and energy providers step up. A tremendous amount of investment is being made in those companies that will be supplying electricity or hydrogen uh, to the trucking industry. Uh, and this is just a, a really exciting period of growth. Uh, and, uh, and California is going to show the rest of the nation that this is, is possible uh, and, and feasible. Uh, and I think what's also worth noting is that uh, based on what California has already done, we uh, have now gotten... 33, 30, I'm sorry, 34 other nations signed up uh, working uh, together under something called the Drive to Zero Global Memorandum of Understanding. 34 nations already working together to also hit those, those same targets. The, the latter target is a little bit different. It's 2040, 100% to zero emission. But this is already a global movement that started here in California and now has expanded uh, globally. I think California's approach to getting to uh, a cleaner, zero carbon commercial vehicle industry is smart. What they've said is we want uh, zero emission vehicles uh, to be in the market and then leave it up to the market to decide, you know, is it going to be electric? Is it going to be hydrogen? Uh, or maybe some other new technology that may come along. Uh, so that's going to be up to the market and, and we'll see, we're already seeing the creativity of the, of the market uh, at play. I think in some of the smaller vehicles, uh, uh, for instance, FedEx or Amazon delivery vans, where, which are now, we're talking about it in the thousands, uh, you're deployed here in California. Uh, those, are, those are tending to go toward battery electric. Uh, but there are already some, some fleets now uh, that are operating uh, fuel cell trucks. So these are trucks running on, on hydrogen uh, the, the only mission is, is water. Uh, and uh, the benefit of those fuel cell trucks, which are mostly being deployed in the, the heavy, heavy truck segment, uh, is that they can quickly refill, uh, say, in 30 minutes, uh, compared to waiting a couple of hours when you're trying to recharge battery packs. So uh, this, uh, we're already seeing fuel cell trucks uh, being deployed. Uh, California is providing a lot of the funding for not only the purchase of those trucks, both battery and fuel cell trucks, but then also providing funding for the stations uh, that either refuel or recharge uh, those trucks as well. So California is making a, a full-throated effort to make this work uh, by not only setting tough standards and regulations that will 
uh, help everybody, but then also providing the funding to make this transition possible. In general, the, the, the costs of battery electric trucks are more expensive at the point of purchase uh, than, a, than a diesel truck. Uh, and fuel cell trucks tend to be even a little bit more expensive than a battery electric truck. But the, what's really important is to think about what's the, the total economic picture for the fleet operator. Uh, and uh, what we're finding is that the total cost of ownership over the lifetime of that truck or the, the period of which the, the fleet operator uses it the, there is an economic saving with both battery electric, and we expect that to be also the case with, with fuel cell trucks. We have a lot more battery electric trucks on the road, so we have better better data. But in, in general, uh, electricity on a per mile basis is cheaper than, than diesel. And then uh, electric trucks uh, are have far fewer say, uh, maintenance and service expenses. For instance, uh, the electric trucks, both fuel cell and battery, capture braking energy. So the uh, the brakes last much longer, two to three times longer. You don't have oil changes. You don't have all the other fluid changes. So the maintenance costs go way down. And the other thing about that is the uptime goes up. So because the trucks aren't taken out of service for an oil change for a brake replacement, they can be used. Uh, so the uptime of those trucks goes up, and and they're 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 available. So, um, and and the the only direction that we're going to see with battery electric trucks, and I think I believe also with hydrogen fuel cell trucks, is the the purchase price will just decline from this point going forward. We're going to find ways to make uh, green hydrogen cheaper and deliver it to stations, and battery costs are are only going to go down. Uh, and the performance will also improve. So the economic picture from this point forward will, will only get better for zero emission trucks. To make all this possible, uh, we need a, a robust uh, electricity grid. Uh, and then we also need to, to think about how we produce that, that green hydrogen and, and, and ensuring that capacity is there. Uh, some people, you know, try to they get a little concerned or worried and, you know, can we, can we improve the grid? Can we, can we increase the size of its capability? Well, the utility industry has been around for a long time and, and that's for a good reason. They, they know how to manage their, their business and manage power. You go back to the 1950s when air conditioning was not built and all of a sudden people saw, wow, this is a tremendous technology. Uh, it makes some of my living, you know, a lot better. And so everybody wanted to, to have the air conditioning in their homes and their buildings. So that was a tremendous impact on the grid. The utility industry figured out how to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, there are there are some challenges right now about, you know, can we quickly get bring the power that's needed to, say, a new truck depot or to a new truck stop? Uh, it, and the utilities right now are a little bit challenged. Uh, it's taking the lead time is taking a little bit longer than everybody would wish. Uh, but they're they're trying to figure out how to shorten that, and, and there are some good solutions underway. The other thing that we're seeing is there are a number of interim solution providers stepping up. So there are companies you know, coming to the fleets and to the truck stops and say, hey, I understand it may take two years for the utility to provide power. What we can do is we'll bring in a portable generator, uh, run on low carbon, clean fuels, and we'll also bring a, a bank of batteries, stationary storage. And with the, these interim solutions, we can provide you with the power that you need as as the trucks, as your truck fleet starts to make the transition. Usually if you got a truck depot and there are 100 trucks, you don't get 100 trucks overnight. You get 10 and then you get 20. So they slowly ramp up. And these interim providers are able to provide the power that's needed. It, it, they're making sure that it's very clean. Uh, and then when the utility finally gets the power delivered, that generator and those backup powers are there to provide resilience and backup power should anything happen to the grid. And that is a key factor. The, the fleets need to have uh, certainty that they're going to have the power when they need it. And if there is an issue with the grid, they need to have that backup power. 
And that's what is so great about these interim solutions. They've got already got their generator there. They've got a back, backup energy storage batteries there. So if something happens to the grid, they they can uh, they can have that backup power. In addition to questions about the grid, people say, well, well, how about the trucks and and where where are they? Why are they coming? Um, and you know we are seeing it that that small in the smaller truck space, a number of of innovators and and startups providing. Uh, battery electric delivery trucks for, for the urban areas. Uh, Rivian has delivered over 10,000 electric vans to Amazon that are already in operation uh, throughout the United States, about 5,000 of them in, in California alone. In the bigger truck space, uh, we are largely relying at this point on the, the conventional manufacturers like Daimler and Packard and Navistar and Volvo. Uh, but uh, Tesla is also built a, a semi truck uh, that is uh, being used now by a number of fleets, including uh, PepsiCo and Frito Lay, and they are really impressed with the performance of that electric semi truck. There have been a few days when they've been able to record a thousand miles of operation in a single day in that Class A Tesla semi truck, and that's hauling not only the Pepsi Frito Lay's chips. Uh, but also their beverage, the, the the soft drinks. Quality of the product will only improve, and then there will also be looking at new strategies to uh, to really reduce the the charging time. And then on the the fuel cell truck side, there are two manufacturers right now, uh, a startup by the name of Nikola, and then Hyundai are are both now uh, operating fuel cell trucks here in California. So um, I, I think that's also super encouraging and, and uh, I'm very optimistic about the potential of those firms and then other companies that are working on fuel cell truck technology as well. Along the way here, we're, we're trying something that's, that's never been done before. Uh, it's not akin to what uh, NASA encountered when they try to put a, put a man on the moon. Uh, we'll, we'll find challenges, uh, and I think, but I think we'll be able to overcome them. This is uh, the, the technology is there. It's no longer a question of, you know, can we, do we have the right technology and the technological capability? Now it's a point of, can, can we really make it work and implement it? And I, I am super confident that we can. And then the ultimate benefits, uh, and particularly for all those communities that have been so hard hit by diesel pollution over the years, and those communities finally being able to breathe clean and healthy air and live better lives. If you haven't checked out CaliforniaInsider.com, we highly recommend you do that now because we're going to have a lot of news and videos there. And on top of what we have there right now, we're building a really big platform to cover what's happening in California. So you can be informed. We're going to have more shows, more videos from all aspects of life in California. Go to CaliforniaInsider.com and we'll see you there.